Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. I've never really thought of Jason as subversive, but I just found out that's what Wall Street considers him to be. Really? Now, how is that possible at all? Simple. Wall Street believes that real estate investors are dangerous to their schemes because the dirty truth about income property is that it actually works in real life. I know. I mean, how many people do you know, not including insiders, who created wealth with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds? Those options are for people who only want to pretend they're getting ahead. Stocks and other non-direct traded assets are a losing game for most people. The typical scenario is you make a little, you lose a little, and spin your wheels for decades. That's because the corporate crooks running the stock and bond investing game will always see to it that they win. This means, unless you're one of them, you will not win. And unluckily for Wall Street, Jason has a unique ability to make the everyday person understand investing the way it should be. He shows them a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Yep, and that's why Jason offers a one-book set on creating wealth that comes with 20 digital download audios. He shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches you how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And this set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered for only $197. To get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia Book 1, complete with over 20 hours of audio, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. It's my pleasure to welcome Stephanie Hartman to the show. Other than having a great last name, <laughs> like mine, Stephanie is a speaker, author, marketing, and revenue strategist, as well as being a TV host. And we're going to talk today about product creation and joint ventures, two very important things for speakers, authors, and infopreneurs. And Stephanie, welcome. It's great to have you on the line here from Vancouver, Canada, one of my favorite cities. Oh, thanks so much. Great to be here. Thanks, Jason. Product creation and joint ventures, two vital parts of the infopreneuring business, most definitely. What do you have to say about those? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I work as a consultant to a lot of the really famous, well-known, best-selling authors. And I've worked with Mark Victor Hansen from Chicken Soup to the Soul, um, I worked with T. Harv Eker for three years, Millionaire Mind. And we, we had Harv on the show. Oh, great. You know, and I, so I started off working um, with a lot of these really big guys and, and women in this industry and then ended up helping really anyone that has an expertise and helping them turn it into um, a business. And a lot of these authors and speakers or people uh, who want to create this as a business, what a lot of them do is they just write one book or they have one speech that they give and they get paid for that. And 
And basically what I teach them how to do is to create a whole business back end behind them. So really a brand and a business where they're selling some type of a system, but they're the spokesperson for it. So even if it's their own uh, baby with their own materials in it, I want to empower them to have it run online or empower trainers who can uh, teach the information so that you know they can go out and teach about it and they have this huge business running in, in the background. So product creation is, is pretty huge um, as a revenue generator. It's the biggest revenue generator for authors and speakers. Most people think that you make a lot of money from selling a book and Really, the whole purpose of a book is to uh, let people know about your online program. It's basically like a big business card. So, um, in fact, Robert Allen, who wrote Multiple Streams of Income, he's a friend and colleague of mine, and he um, told me on the phone about his $25 million mistake. So his, his $25 million mistake was in one of his first books, which he took on the road, took him a year to, you've probably seen the infomercials where you come meet me at this hotel and, and I'm going to teach you um, on the subject of my book. You know, Have you seen those infomercials, Jason? Oh, sure, sure. And by the way, you should say that many years ago, Robert Allen was the inspiration for my real estate career and real estate investments. And I've, uh, I was actually on his infomercial years ago endorsing him. And back when he wrote Nothing Down and Creating wealth many, many years ago. Uh, so yeah, stuff, yeah, so so that's that's a that's great. And so what he um what he told me about a twenty five million dollar mistake is in his one of his first books, he sold um he made a million dollars from his book and he sold a million copies, but he hired a publicist which costs anywhere I mean publicists can from anywhere from ten thousand dollars a month or up to twenty thousand dollars. I mean it just really varies on the packages that you get. He had to rent the hotel rooms, he had to do all this stuff and so he he made a million dollars, but it took him a year, and he was completely exhausted, and a lot of travel, and a lot of hotels, and then he realized on one of his other books, which was deemed a publishing failure, and that's from his lips, so (laughs) I'm not dogging on him, that's what he said, it was considered a publishing failure, because it only sold a few thousand copies, but it was a massive marketing success, because, and this is the power of creating back-end products, is throughout his book, he just had in 15 different places, if you want if you want to download this chart that I'm talking about or you want to see the video of the interview that I'm talking about in the book or you want to see the hidden chapter that never made it in the book through publishing go to this website and it was just basically a his website.com forward slash chart or forward slash video forward slash free offer whatever it was in the book so people went to his site and they put it, their name and their email address into his website and in about a year, he had 5,000 people buying his $5,000 program. This is a weekend event where you could come see Robert and you learn everything that you learn inside his $20 book. And, then, and that is strictly from the book, those 5,000 people? Yeah. So it's 5,000 people who, came, who went through his site, got on his list, and then came to, came to his event. So 5,000 times 5,000 is $25 million. And see, that's the, that's the difference in having you know, a back end. It's so, so important. And so, so one of the things to just start to think about creating a product, a product can be a weekend event, a product can be an online program, it can be a membership site, it, but... You know, if you want to start somewhere, the first place to really start is what is your topic, what do you want to teach people, and what do you want them to achieve? Because most good teachers want someone to do something with the information, right? So it can be anything from, so if you answer those questions, then look at your topic and and just create something from it, even if it's just audio recordings plus some templates, and, you know, create a you know, a four-week program where, you know, once a week um, you're talking about something, then giving a little homework and things like that. So I can't get into all the details of exactly how to do it. Of course, I take people through the exact process. And then there are things you want to create, like lead generating products before that and upper-level products after that and some type of product that is a continuancy product where simply someone is paying you monthly for some training or support like they pay their cable bill every month. So that's a great way to to earn money. But if you just start with your core product, then that's really the first thing you have to 
you, you want to think about. So I want to talk about joint ventures fairly extensively in this show, Stephanie. But before we do that, certainly I think speakers all agree with you nowadays that products are, are where it's at. And it, it seems like in today's world, everybody and their brother is becoming an infopreneur of some sort. And as a consumer, you've got to learn to distinguish the wheat from the chaff for sure. But what tips do you have on product creation? I mean, you mentioned event can be a product. So when you talk about products, you're talking events or products. But how can a speaker really get down and do it and create more products or better products or, or maybe create their first product, depending on who's listening and, and what their thoughts are on it? Yeah, the first thing that I do is I, I go through kind of a product plan with people. So, you know, we look at their expertise and then we get really, really specific on their target market because you need to know who you're talking to. Because if you say your product is for everyone, then virtually it's for no one. The reason I say that is because people need to, when they're listening to you, they need to know who you work with. They need to know what your product is for. That's really the first thing to look at. So to figure out your target market, one of the questions I ask people is, is if you could work with anyone, who would you love to work with? If you could hang out with anyone on a Tuscan hillside drinking a glass of wine and spend the weekend with chatting with and, and you get excited about it, who would it be? I mean, for me, it's entrepreneurs. So that's the group. I love entrepreneurs. I think they're courageous. I think they're exciting. I love their ideas, their innovations. Those are the people that I just get so much energy being around. So that's my, that's my target. But, you know, you may be in the travel industry, let's say, and, you, and so you're thinking, well, maybe the travel industry could be my target. I mean, that's great. And let's even get more specific. I mean, there's a podcasting expert that I'm working with who's a client of mine, and he's got podcasting, but he found a great little niche going after um, retail businesses. Then he may have another niche going after nonprofits. Then you may have another niche going after small business entrepreneurs and maybe break that down into like real estate agents. Or So the more you can break your niche down, then you really know who you're talking to. And then it's really finding out what are the pains that are going on, what are the problems, what are they feeling, what is the situation that's happening to them that's bringing them to you or your product. And when I think about my target market, I think about them in two ways. One is really, okay, let's identify them specifically, like age, sex, profession, uh, married, single, all of that stuff. So you really get sort of a three-dimensional picture of them. Do they have kids? What's their income bracket? All of that. Then I think of them kind of like situationally. So emotionally, you know, what's gone on in their life that they're coming to you for this solution or they're looking for you in this solution? What has happened to them with them trying to buy products that are similar to you? I mean, if you answer these questions, then you'll, you know, you'll get a better feeling and they'll become more human to you. Like, for example, I work with a lot of baby boomers. So I know that certain things about that demographic, but I also know that this is a time where people have spent their entire lives, you know, working for someone else and now they want to do something that's just for them. So any business that they're going to create online, whether it's a book they're going to write and any products they're going to create, it has to mean something to them. And if it doesn't have still some sense of purpose for them and really incorporate them and their personality into it, they're not going to be interested. So I make sure that, you know, when I talk about it, I say, hey, you know, this is a great business. It's inexpensive to start. You're your own boss. You work your own hours. And I'm going to teach you how to build your business based on your personality strengths so that it's a business that you love. So if you love speaking, we're going to add that in. If you don't, we're going to go with an online business. I mean, we can really if you like to travel. We can add that in. If you don't, you know, we can, we can change that in the business model. I give different business models how to do it. It's customized for them. But the biggest part is, I say, this isn't really about the money. The money is going to be great for you, but the bigger reason for doing this is really reinventing yourself and becoming the person you're meant to be and, and really fulfilling that dream that you have. So it's really knowing, and all those things are really true and really dear to why I create things too. So it's just really listening um, to your customer, figuring out your target market and seeing them as a person. And that's the first place I would start. So even on a sales page, and I've hired copywriters and some are incredible, but I found I hired a copywriter, it cost me I think $15,000 and I've, this is the first time I ever did that. And my sales actually went down on the site. And so I ripped it all off and I just spoke from the heart, and I started to identify my customer, and I said, look, if you are, and I identified all of that, the age, the group, the professions, all of that 
in there. And then I said, and this is what you're thinking and going through, and have you ever felt this and that, and then here's the solution. And that was the way that I helped develop my product and also the way that I um, thought about uh, marketing my product. And I find now, and we'll talk about this when we talk about joint ventures, is that if people hear the truth, it's just so different than what anyone else is, is marketing or creating. So when you're creating your products, they really recognize the truth as soon as they hear it. And that cuts off the BS factor, and there's a lot of that going out on there. Oh, that's for sure. Stephanie, to your earlier point about really getting to know who that audience is so that you're in their shoes and you you really know them. I mean, one brand that comes to mind, I don't know if it's too, such a big brand anymore, but it was. It's. Uh, I was reading an article, I think it was in Forbes, about Tommy Bahama, the clothing line. Tommy Bahama, there is no such person that exists with that name, right? But all of the employees as part of the corporate culture sort of view this fictitious person as a real person. How would that person think? What would they do? What would they like? What would they dislike? And this is the fictitious Tommy Bahama character. And it's an interesting point because in targeting and, and really developing narrow audiences is is what it's all about nowadays. It's, it's the concept of the long tail. And the long tail concept basically says that, look, in the olden days with storefront type of businesses, it was very hard to specialize like you can today because you existed in a geographical neighborhood or maybe with some mail order or things like that. And you couldn't reach that very, very niche, narrow, specific audience, that specific buyer, that specific consumer like you can now on the internet. So someone can type in, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but they can go and they can search online for single mom speaker speakers whose kids are into soccer <laughs> and and they can then write a blog for that and create info products that serve that audience. Yeah, or car lovers, you know, you don't have to see how many car lovers are around my neighborhood. You know, it's it's people from from all over the world. That's what makes this business so successful. And the second reason is But it's better than that because it's not just car lovers. It's what kind of car, what year of car. It's like really narrow nowadays, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. And and to figure out, you know, what type of... So the last thing, you you know, I would do is, and of course, this is a a big process that I, I take people through through a whole month just on this topic alone, but... It's to figure out what your product is going to be, just to simple it down really simply is find out what they want. Like you said, you know, once you think about your customer in a three-dimensional format, what do they want is the, is the reasons why they're going to come to you. Then what do they need? Because you know things that they need that they don't even know about yet. Add those in and then figure out what's the best way for this particular group to get this information from me. Is it in person? Is it online? All of those things, because that can really help change whether this is something that's online or it is an in-person process as well. Well, hey, now that we know our customer, and that's some very good insight into that, we know who we're looking for, we know who our target market is, and we've developed products that give them what they want. How do we spread the word and create additional influence by joint venturing? Now, and, and maybe distinguish for the listeners, if you would, Stephanie, too, what is the difference between J and affiliate marketing because affiliate marketing obviously you know a huge online industry of having affiliates sell your products but as you think about joint ventures there are some distinctions right yeah absolutely and in, in fact I created a whole network called the private JV club and it's really a club of CEOs and people that are there that want to partner with each other and are looking for it from around the world it's, it's really cool we have people from from Starbucks to Oprah to regular Joes in there. But really, what is a JV? A JV is really two people or two parties coming together for a common goal. So it's a joint venture. And this has actually been called by Price Waterhouse Cooper, who does this report every year. They, they interview the top CEOs who've made uh, multi millions of dollars in their companies, and they find out you know, what is the biggest thing that's made the biggest difference inside your business. And joint ventures has come across as, as part of the top. And, you know, even Forbes magazine is talking about it. It said, goodbye mergers and acquisitions. You know, in a global market tied together by the Internet, joint ventures are proving a more productive way to keep companies growing. And Thompson Financial actually called it the most powerful trend in the history of business. And the reason why joint ventures are so powerful is because it's really one of the top marketing strategies, and huge corporations have been doing this for years, but entrepreneurs 
are just learning about it now. And it's, it's, you can actually, as an entrepreneur, sell products with no money, no customer list, and no risk. And you, the reason that you can do this is because in a lot of type of joint ventures, you can find promotional products that will promote your product to their own customer list. So if you don't have a customer list, they will promote it for you. There's no risk because you're not paying them to do it. Where if you placed an ad in the newspaper, right, if you wanted a front page ad in the newspaper, it costs you maybe 10 grand, and you have your product up there, and if no one phones, you know, you can't go back to the newspaper and say, oh, you know, I didn't make money on that ad, so um, I'm not going to pay you now, right? <laughs> I mean, they would throw you out of the office, right? I mean, they wouldn't, that never happens. But in joint ventures, many, many times, in fact, almost 100% of the time, no one puts any cash up front, and you, you both sell products or your partner is selling your product uh, for you to their customer list, and you pay them a commission based on the product sold. So it's not even money that you have. It's money that your customers send you. And until, not until you don't pay them until you even get the product to your customer, you know, and a lot of times three days is up, and, and, and then you pay your, your partner. So it's a really economical and fast, fast way to get your name out there. And the other benefit of using someone else's customer list is now all of a sudden you're not going to a cold market, you know, which everyone hates. You're going to a warm market. You're immediately welcomed into a warm market because the person that owns that customer list is actually, you know, has a big relationship with their uh, list. So it's like bringing in a friend into a party where everyone else at the party is friends and you walk in and he says, hey, this is my good friend, Jason. Oh, he's got this great product out. Let me tell you about him. And everyone goes, oh, hi, Jason. Great to meet you. And blah, blah, blah. Like, it's a completely different situation than you walking into a room and trying to talk about yourself. It's a really different way. And, you know, you've seen a lot of the powerful, uh, like, you you know, we were we were talking a bit about there seems to be, like, a lot of businesses where, you know, they've got, you know, five or six friends and all of them are or joint venturing and promoting each other. I mean, that's very common in this industry. Um, and in fact, you could do timed campaigns, which is just a way of structuring your JV, where you've probably seen an email that comes through and says, so-and-so is launching a product, and if you buy it by X date, you know, you'll get whatever bonuses. And you get five or six emails like that saying the exact same thing from completely different people. I know. I get, I get them all the time. It seems as though I'm on every list. But the question is, Stephanie, the $64,000 question is, how do you do that? If someone is really wanting to get into this, and maybe they've been speaking, maybe they've written a book or two, they've done sort of that traditional thing. Now they're moving into the joint venture internet marketing world. What's in it for the other party? I mean, people aren't just going to hand over their customer list to you, obviously. In fact, you probably won't get their customer list. But the biggest thing is the new currency, really, in the new economy is is, is relationships. So your your first job is really building building a relationship. And the first thing I would think of when I when I want to create a JV and figure out well who can I JV with is the first thing to know is is who is your target market. And we already talked about this. You know who is your customer? Think of them as a whole being. What do they buy? You know is another great question. Where do they hang out? Or what do they like to do? You know let's say for example if you've got a great product that's great. For the boomer market, you might, you know that they like to hang out at golf uh, resorts. They like, they're interested in boating. They like lifestyle products. So you might even joint venture with someone like that. Thinking this way actually expands your, your partnership possibilities, which is the first thing you need to do to be successful in joint ventures. So think also what business service or products do they use before or after they come to you. A great example of that is the JV marriage of FedEx and Kinko's. I mean, if FedEx thought about this, they think, okay, so I'm shipping a lot of products. What do we mostly ship? Documents. Okay, well, where are the people, you know, where do people get the documents from? Well, they go and get them copied at Kinko's, right? Kinko's thinking about what do our customers do when they leave our door? They go to uh, ship off their, they're on their way running to FedEx and hoping they'll make it in time, right? So those two guys got together and they said, look, you know, we will capture way more of the market if we work together and co-mingle our offices. We can share retail space, so we're sharing the costs in half. We immediately save a huge amount of money in, that, in their, both businesses. You know, the staff is half, the uh, retail space is half. They could even 
double all their offices in different locations and be using the same amount of money per year for expenses. And they're both getting more customers because people can easily do both services at one time. They can ship the documents. They can copy the documents. So you mentioned affiliate marketing. And affiliate marketing is, is really is kind of a, a different beast. It's a little less relationship-oriented. It's more like how many products can I sell? And it's about and finding affiliates to, to promote your product is always a, a good thing. But if you think of joint ventures more in a much bigger way, um, who could I build a, a, a lifelong relationship with that would be a good partner that could bring customers to me? So the, the really next one question to think about is what companies currently have a relationship with your target market, right? Because that's the key word I said there is a relationship. So there may be companies, there may be entrepreneurs, there may be services, there may be charity organizations, there may be big corporations. Who already has a relationship with your specific target market? If I've got a product that I want to sell to dentists, I'm going to start creating a relationship with the dental associations. I'm going to find if there's any dentists that are authors and see if they have a database and, and promote to them. I'm going to look at the magazines that cater to dentists. You know, I'm going to look to see if there's any TV shows. I'm going to look to see if there's any charitable organizations that you know, help with kids getting their teeth uh, fixed, all of those things. The insurance companies that work with uh, dentists and insure them. What about the companies that supply the equipment to the de- dentist's office? And, you know, if I can put a promotion out to them, they've already got a database list of all the dentists that use their, you know, all their machines, their medical equipment, all that stuff. Those are potential partners. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. So so the question is though, I get the partners and that's uh, those are very good thoughts. How does one offer the partner value, the target partner? Is it to say, well, I'll give you 50% of the sales? That's what the affiliate marketing world does. Which is really not normal in the real world. I agree so with you. Ab- yeah, that's a you know, high number. Absolutely. Yeah. Pretty much the ratios, if someone is running your product and they're a well-known online marketer, it's pretty much 50% if it's something that is like an online program, maybe a workshop, but if it's, if it's consulting time or something like that that's very, very time-based that you're selling, then it's usually between 10 and 20%. So you can you can negotiate um, that on the back end, and in the in the beginning, it's a good way to start because even if you're giving away 50%, that's 50% you didn't have before, and you're getting that database list. What I would do on top of that is give away something for free, so you capture a database leads or customer leads of people that didn't buy your product as well from the partners that you're working with. That may be a good good way to do it. So offer a free ebook, offer a contest, offer anything you can so that you can gather those leads. Um, and there's lots of mobile marketing things that you could do where people could type in their phone and and, um, and contact you as, as well as going online. So there's there's lots of ways to do it, and, and I help people um, figure that out. But one of the kiss of death that I got when someone wanted to partner with me, and this is one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're approaching uh, joint venture partners like you're talking about, is I had someone that was phoning up my office and wanted to meet with me, but wasn't happy meeting on the phone, wanted to meet in person. And I said, look, you know, I'm really busy. I don't want to, you know, I don't know anything about you and, and all this stuff, you know, and I'm not going to drive all the way out to have lunch with someone that I don't know yet, right, unless there is some type of a compelling reason, because you can get those calls every single day. And was calling my assistant, you know, for about two months, and then finally I said, okay, you know, persistent wins out. All right, I'll come and I'll meet you. Let's have coffee for 20 minutes, right? And so I go in, I drive into town, I come into the coffee shop, and the first thing 
that he says to me when he sit down is he said, he says, oh, thanks for coming out um, and seeing me. And I said, sure, no problem. And he said, so can you tell me a bit about what you do? And that drove me insane. Because here's a guy that's been after me for months to meet with me, and this is what he says. And nothing will piss somebody off faster than you don't know what they do, and they don't know who their target market is, you don't know what they're selling, and all of that. So the first thing when you when you want to approach a partner is research. Okay. Right. You wanna you wanna know who and why you're approaching so that you can offer the value proposition right away, right? Yeah. So in order to figure out the value proposition, you wanna know is what you're offering them, let's say it's your product or something, or something that you're hoping that they'll promote for you. If it is not a match to their target market, they're not gonna be interested. Even if your product isn't sensational. You know, so that's the first thing you need to know. You need to really know who they're targeting. Second, I would be on their list or jump on their company website and learn what you can about the person in charge, the CEO. What is their agenda for this year? Are there any charities that they're involved in? Do they have a mission this year? Are they going in a new direction? What do they really want to get out there and, and promote? And then second of all, think not what you want and need, but how you can help them. Because that's the biggest thing. If you can come across as someone that helps them out, then you will completely distinguish yourself from everybody else. And then you don't have to worry about the value so much. I'll talk about that in a little bit second because I'm still getting to there. But the number one mistake, and this is the biggest complaint, I interviewed like hundreds of you know, the most successful people in this business and asked them, Tell me privately, like, what, what upsets you, you know, and when you get JV proposals, either via email or on the phone, and why, why do you decide to go yes with someone? Because there are some people that if you're the right person, you come across the right way, even if you're just starting, they will take you under their wing and they will do, you know, they will promote you, even though you don't have a huge list and you don't have anything huge to offer them in return. But here's the, the first thing you need to do is build rapport. That's your first mission. You know, your, maybe your first one is research. Your second one is build rapport. And so after you do the research, you find out they're a match for you, then build rapport. And, and here's the thing. Most, I kind of reckon JVs as dating. So you're back into the dating world. And what most people do when they open up a conversation and they send in an email, they do the equivalent of this. They walk into a bar and let's say, Jason, you know, you see this pretty girl sitting on, you know, a bar stool up there. And imagine yourself if you go up to her and you say, hi, my name is Jason Hartman and um, this is what I do and this is what I sell and, and I, I think, here's what I think we should do. I think we should get together. I think we should get married. I think this is where we should have our house. I think this is the exact dog we should she get. She would this run for the hills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here's, here's what you're going to get out of it. And you're going to be so happy. So, you know, do we have a deal? Right. Yeah, she would think you're insane, yeah, right? of course. And you get these huge bodyguards coming up. But this is what people do every day when they meet business contacts. And the thing that I tell people is, you've got something in your mind. You're like, look, I would be so excited if so-and-so company would promote me, you know, promote my product, either send an email out or, or have me up on their stage or promote me through their newsletter, or maybe even we co-create a product together. What I usually suggest is have that in mind, but go there with an open mind. Your first thing to do is build rapport. So when you find out what's important to them, then you can have conversations with them and you could say, look, I, I noticed that this is one of your goals. I've got a contact here that I'd like to shoot your way. I could set that meeting up for you. Would that be something that would be of interest for you? And they'll go, yeah, that would be great. And you just come out of the blue like, oh, this is cool. I'm kind of, you know, doing this. This is neat. And then you could say, you know, secondly, you know, I've been watching your stuff for long or I saw this new product that you're, you're going to be launching next year. I think it would be really great. You know, I talked to the same demographic and, you know, this is why I think your product is going to be so hot and so great with them. And I'd love to introduce your product to them and, you know, maybe we can find a way to make that happen. You know, and they say, yeah, yeah, maybe, th maybe we can find a way to make that happen. And say, yeah, and I, you know, I'm working on something too and this is what it is and, and I think it would, it would complement and not compete with what you're doing um, because of it's this way. And if there's some way we can, you know, maybe sometime in the future or something we can, we could talk about that, I, I, I'd love to do that. You know, and it's funny, I had a conversation with a woman that is famous for never doing joint ventures. 
And she says on her website, don't contact me. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So she's like got the sign up, I don't want to date anybody. I don't want to date anybody. And it's true. And it's because she gets these crazies that come up to her in the bar and do have that conversation with her all the time. And she just, it's like people pulling on your skirt or your pant leg and saying, here's what I need, here's what I need, here's what I need, right? All about me, 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 me. And she's got all these goals. She's got this busy business. She's trying to do all this stuff. So I just tested this out, you know, even and on this conversation. And, and you know, she has the same name, uh, first name as me. I won't tell you her last name or you'll figure it out. But she had this first, same first name as me. And we talked about that. And I said, you know, I've been, I've been hearing about you from so-and-so colleagues. And they're always saying we should connect. And, you know, I just looked at your product. Wow, that looks so hot. And started talking about it and getting her engaged in what she is interested in. And I said, you know, what are your, what are your, plans for, you know, the next year? Is there, is there anything, like one major project you're really excited about? And then I, then I said to her, you know, I think I'd really be, I'll really be able to help you in some way. You know, let me know. You know, maybe I can help you in any of these three ways. They may have nothing to do with what I currently do. It could be a contact. It could be, hey, if you want advice, it could be anything. Or why don't I find a contact that could help you with that? You know, and you try to find someone that can help them if you can't do it. Everything you're saying reminds me of this story that Earl Nightingale used to tell about the person on the white horse. During the Great Depression, employers put up signs in their windows, or not employers, but businesses that were still in business, put up signs in their windows that said, no help wanted, because they were just deluged with people coming in saying, do you have any jobs? I need a job. And there was one person, the man on the white horse, who would, would find a business or an industry that he wanted to be in, and he would research it, learn about it, and make the call on that that company and say, I understand the problems your business faces, and I believe I have the solution for you. And that's what every business owner wants to hear, right? Instead of, I need a job. And it's just the way you approach it, exactly what you're saying. That's a great point. Yeah. And, you know, and really, you know, with that, it's, it's just having, you know, short conversations. And if you think about it, if I can have like a rapport building, two minute conversation, it's probably going to turn into a lot longer. I had someone that I met that wanted so much to get in and talk to Steve Wynn from Las Vegas. He owns a Wynn Resort. And, you know, and Wynn said, you've got five minutes. Well, he knew what Wynn interests were and he started talking to them. And it ended up being a two hour interview. And now we've got contacts and he built a huge relationship. So my number one tip is, is don't go in there thinking you know exactly what the joint venture is going to be between the two of you. Because you know what? Once you build a relationship and rapport with that person, they may even have a better idea of how you could work together. Maybe your product could be a bonus for their paid clients who've bought their customers and you just they pay you a wholesale rate for that. What you really want to get to, and you can get to it quickly, is having people co-create with you. Because if someone co-creates something, then they will support it. You can have a more powerful sales launch if you have even one partner that is super on board with you than a hundred smaller affiliate partners who don't really know you, they don't really care if your product goes or not, they're sending out the email but maybe it doesn't go to everybody, or they forget to send it out, all of that. But if you have one person or two people that's really supporting you and getting it out there, you know, that's because you have a relationship with them and you want them, you know, ask them, how could we, here's, here's some ideas I had, but what do you see? What do you think? You know, how would this work in? And you give them the power, you know, instead of being all over them, you're talking to them like an equal. And the last thing I just want to make, I know we're almost out of time, is about the value is you bring tremendous value. I mean, one of the things you could even bring is, is knowledge on a subject, which may be your product, that they don't currently offer to their clients, but it's something that they need. Maybe you're the FedEx to their kinkos. So maybe you've got a computer program or a system or something that's brand new. You haven't even sold it to anyone. You want to take it to someone who has a huge database. But if it helps them, you say, you know what, Joelcom, I know you've got this, um, this product on Twitter. I would actually have a program that could probably help you sell more of those books if we even tied them together. That would be an interesting conversation for him to have. He'd be very interested in it. Plus, if it took up very little of his time. And one example of a very simple JV, just to get you thinking, is there was a woman who wrote this book on toast. Not the bread, but, you know, when you go to a party and you make a speech, right? 
and you're going to toast. So she went through the process that I talk about. Who is your target market? Well, there are people at weddings, at, at giving birth, I mean, all of these big events, birthday parties where people are giving toast. So who else is targeting that customer? Well, sparkling wine and champagne companies are. She was a self-published author. She had no connections, and she started writing a letter to every single sparkling wine and champagne company she could have, and she suggested right, a co-creation JV where she said, I've got this book on toasts, and it's 101 toasts. So you can give it a party, and here's why I love your sparkling wine. I think it would be perfect for the event, and there's something that we could do together uh, to promote. So she had a company that said yes. They didn't know her from anyone. Had a company that said yes, and here's what they did to her. They, first of all, what they did is they bought tens of thousands of her books. Done. One phone call, done. Now, she charged them a wholesale rate plus five, six bucks, right? So she made money right there. Then what they did is they packaged it and they, they had a promotion. She says, let my book help promote your product. Remember the theme I said, let my product help promote your product and what you're trying to do. So they came up with a concept that if you bought two bottles of champagne, you got her book for free, which is great, right? So instead of people buying one bottle, they buy two bottles, right? And you can imagine all the best men and all the bridesmaids, all these things going and running out to the parties and getting this. And so they actually bought her books. She didn't have to pay for the drivers to haul the champagne bottles, to haul the books. She didn't have to pay for the retail space in the liquor stores or the, or the uh, shopping stores that you know, are selling them. She didn't have to pay for all the advertising promotion that the company was doing. She didn't have to pay for the staff in the liquor store to stock the shelves and put the books up. She didn't have to pay for any of the advertising on TV or radio or newspaper or anything that had this big promotion of if you buy two bottles of champagne, you get this for free. Much, much better business model, much easier, and wow, yeah. what a hit. And, and, and across the country instantly because she had a national partner on that. And then if this you know, works, they're going to do it again and again and again. Think of another fun way of how to work together. So. That's just a quick example of how she used all of those pieces and came up with that model. And she was she had a self-published book, and she wasn't a celebrity at all. Excellent point, Stephanie. We're going to have some special offers at speakingofwealth.com slash offers. I'll repeat that, speakingofwealth.com slash offers. And your website, stephaniehartman.com. Stephanie, you wanted to offer like a, a free workbook or something like that on there? Yeah, I absolutely did because this is a really big subject and I have a I have a course on this, but if you want, you can actually get a free membership into the JV Club where you can meet partners that's got matchmaking technology that can actually it's like it's like the dating site for business. <laughs> and you you can get in for, for one month um, free and then if you want to continue you can and you can also get a sixty three page workbook that really talks about what is a JV. It gives you tons of examples, whether you want to go to trade shows for free. I got my clients all over trade shows for free. I got celebrity endorsements for their trade show booth, and they, within two weeks of them going to the trade show, that cost them nothing. How to get you know, a national sales team with no expense, how one woman partnered with one person and went from a $300,000 a year business to a $1.3 million a year business because two people going to the same market just put their products together. And, and really why this is working, true staff even about why this is working in this economy now. And it talks a little bit about charities and, and corporations too. But then there's a workbook where you can really punch in all of the things about you, and you'll be able to walk away after you read this and fill it out of knowing exactly who you can partner with, how you're going to approach them, and almost everything you need to do it. And, and that's, that's going to be there on, um, on that website that, that you mentioned. So you're welcome to that. I sold that at $97, and I had 2,000 downloads in 24 hours for that book. And it's really the wave of the future. And you never have to work alone anymore, you know. You know, and this is a big thing. Collaboration is really the wave of the future. Yeah, it, it it really is. And it's it's really always worked so well historically, too. But nowadays, even people that you consider people or businesses that you consider in some way your competitors, I love the title of, of the book that addresses this several years ago called Coopetition. Because in today's world, one plus one does not necessarily equal two. Sometimes it equals 11. That's, yeah, that's the power absolutely. of this and, collaboration, and you know. Yeah, my new book coming out is going to be called Six Degrees to Wealth, and it's really about the six degrees of separation that we have, and it's, it, it will blow your mind how 
close you are to the context that you really want. And there's a study that um, actually proves this. And I'll, I'm going to be talking about that. If we have more time, I would, I would give it. But, I mean, it's, it's really the, the wave of the future. And you'll be able to identify, too, even just by reading this free workbook of who is an abundant thinker and who is a lack thinker. Because you don't want to waste your time doing a JV deal with a lack thinker. And those lack thinkers, are their businesses are going down right now. I've seen it in the last three years, a major decline in the industry of lack thinkers. But abundant thinkers working together and collaborating are just – doing amazing. So. Yeah, that's that's great. So Stephanie Hartman, thank you so much for joining us. The free workbook, which was $97 before and a couple thousand downloads. Thank you so much for your generosity in offering that. That will be at speakingofwealth.com slash offers, as well as the links for the free 30-day trial of your business matchmaking group. And those are just excellent things. Thank you, Stephanie, for the uh, words of wisdom and for those generous offers. Stephanie Hartman from Vancouver, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.